Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to What's My Head podcast. Sitting on that side of the screen is the creative Darkwing Duck, man. Tad Stones, how are you, Tad? I'm doing good. Happy to talk. Oh, man, I'm glad. I've been looking forward to this one for the last couple weeks. Uh, You know, usually we'll kick it off, like how you got into animation or or where'd you come up. But but the fans were so rabid when I said Darkwing Duck creator, Chip and Dale. I started naming off all of these eclectic names of our childhood, man. They were like, oh, my God, this one was so inspirational, so influential to me growing up. I wore purple, the color of my shirt. I wore purple because of Drake Mallard, man. So I would love to know, and we'll get into your past a little bit, but I would love to know, man, where were you at when that initial thought for Darkwing Duck just hit up here? And you're like, oh, shit, I got a show about a duck that wears purple, and we're going to do well, it. Well, it didn't happen that way. Uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg. Mm-hmm formerly of DreamWorks, formerly beyond that at Disney. Uh, He basically, I was in, uh, in, when I went to TV animation, I uh, basically was in charge of development. Then they needed me to work into um, taking over a show, which was like the third season of Gummy Bears. And then after that, I pitched, we did Rescue Rangers and then Darkwing followed that. But Darkwing came from Jeffrey Katzenberg ordering me to do a show called Double O Duck. Mm-hmm. There had been a DuckTales episode featuring Launchpad called Double O Duck. He said, it can't be Launchpad. He just liked the name. Yeah. Uh, he and Michael Eisner both, they liked um, uh, catchy names. I mean, we always had to do a quality show. That was what was expected of us, an entertaining show. But they felt like a catchy name gets mentioned more often, gets a bigger tune in to try out your show. So uh, Rescue Rangers came from a long line of development that started with a pitch uh, for Miami Mice because Miami Vice was on the air. And we quickly changed that to Metro Mice. And it was like Mice, basically Hill Street Blues or Cop Show with chipmunks or excuse me, with mice. Uh, And I actually have artwork where they're holding guns, not guns with big rubber parts, but actual guns. Uh, And then we needed a wider concept to... um, get more stories out of because you watch a cop show and you say, okay, now I got to scale that down for kids television. And, oh, we, a lot of cop shows deal with murder, you know, yeah. you know <laughs> violence of all sorts. Um, we couldn't do that. And that turned into Rescue Rangers and eventually Chippendale Rescue Rangers. Darkwing was like that in that Jeffrey just liked the name Double O Duck. So he assigned it to me. And I uh, took a shot at it. I was not excited about it. This is before um, Austin Powers. But I just thought, ah, it's just going to be a James Bond parody, you know, and took my shot at it, tried to make it entertaining, but um, it didn't have heart to it. You know, it, it just was stuff I'd seen before. And Jeffrey saw it and it was like, this is stuff I've seen before <laughs> and it doesn't have any Disney heart in it. So we, you know, at that split second, you say, Hey, me and the boss, we are simpatico. Uh, and then you realize I was very lucky. I realized that the typical thing is you get a shot at something when it, when the idea comes from outside of you, you get a shot at something and they say, yeah, I didn't like his take. We're going to get somebody else to do a take on it. Instead, Jerry said, do it over. Um, and that's when, um, you know, we had, oh, for, I can't remember why I came up with this, but even with Double O Duck, uh, we had um, put him in a mask and a cape, yeah. you know, even though it was a white tuxedo thing. And you look, the preliminary artwork wasn't final designs or meant to be, it was just a placeholder design. He, he looked like Donald Duck, except with a mask and a small little hat and a cape. Um, but he was a spy. Um, when we went into it, back then, Disney TV put people on contract, term contracts, meaning you're signed for three years, an option for two more years, as opposed to now you get hired for a show. Well, the advantage of one, it's more secure to have that kind of contract, but the advantage is Disney is just hiring you as a writer, as a creator. So they, the advantage for Disney is they own everything you dream about, come up with, converse about. But for creators, it's like, if you're stuck on something, you can hire, not hire, you you bring in other guys on staff and just to brainstorm things like that. So I brought in a bunch of the people who I knew I wanted to 
be story editors on the show. And it was Dwayne Capizzi who had done Alf, <laughs> uh, the animated Alf, and uh, Jack Chan Adventures and Men in Black animated and, and has done all sorts of stuff uh, after and before. Uh, Dwayne looked at the artwork and just said, you know, with this mask and cape and the tux double-breasted tuxedo, he, he looks like an old pulp character, like, you know, the Green Hornet or the Shadow. And boom, that exploded in my mind. I loved all those characters. It's not like I grew up with them. It was just through comics fandom, it bled into old radio shows, Pulp Heroes, you know, the golden age of comics. Um, and it was like, I love the shadow and, you know, the green hornet. And especially uh, what clicked for me in Double O Duck was the idea of Doc Savage. Doc Savage had, I mean, he was a Superman kind of guy, uh, as in a peak of physical perfection kind of guy. Uh, but he had a bunch of experts that he worked with. He had a chemist, he had a communications guy, he had a mechanical engineer guy, um, a transportation guy, whatever. They were this weird team, all with broad personalities and eccentrics, and it made for a very entertaining, you know, group. Yeah. And I said, that's what we instead of doing Q and M and Honey Penny and and uh, Money Penny, I should say. Um, <laughs> those characters this is a different way of getting a spy group together so we developed that but then it's just like when you're doing animation and canto aside uh in tv it's like you try to keep a smaller cast um like with rescue rangers it was like five at the most because not only is that your team then you're going to have somebody they're helping then you're going to have villains and you just have so many people to give lines to you either take away from chances for personality um, or, or somebody staying around being silent the whole time with nothing to do. Uh, finally went back and forth, back and forth. And to get that heart, we came up with the idea of what if this ultra cool, this guy who thinks he's ultra cool, because that was always part of the idea, um, had to raise a daughter. Mm -hmm. And that's when it clicked, that gave it the heart. Yeah. Launchpad, curiously, when we did the Doc Savage group, was part of that group. Uh, one of our ideas was because they talked about him being a hero in DuckTales. I mean, in DuckTales, that seemed to be a running thread. Um, and it was like, he always thought he should be in the lead, which was a kind of an antagonistic kind of group. And we finally lost that. And then we ended up cutting down, cutting down for those same reasons I talked about uh, until it was just Launchpad, uh, Goslin, and Double O Duck. And that's what sold. Then Jeffrey loved it. It had heart. It had, you know, obviously the adventure, the comedy coming from personalities. Uh, and then we went out and we sold it. There's even, you know, took ads in Variety announcing it and had little cloisonated pins made uh, with the still looking like Donald Duck, um, but with the white tuxedo design and all of that. Uh, and then Cubby Broccoli was the producer who had the rights to all the Ian Fleming, James Bond stuff. And he informed Disney that no, double O's are not a thing. They come from Ian Fleming's, we own it, you can't use it. Um, so it's kind of like if you've seen double O anything, it's either so small, it's under the radar um, and they didn't follow up, but legally they could. And here Disney was taking out double page spreads in Variety announcing a new show. So they shut that down and we actually had, the only problem is, it wasn't like I loved the name Double O Duck. It was just like that was literally what I was told to do from the beginning. So I had no other names in my head. Um, we had a contest at the studio that um, with a $500 prize, which was, you know, this is 1990, 1999, somewhere in there, uh, which is 500, still okay, even more back then. Uh, and we just got, Reams of just for people on staff. I mean, the entire Disney TV animation staff. Um, you know, Dead Eye Duck, Dead Shot Duck, you know, Dizzy Duck, I mean, any a lot of alliteration in there. Murder Duck, I think, was one things like people just going for stuff. Um, anyway, Alan Burnett, who was at Disney at the time, came up with Darkwing, and I immediately 
boom. And I, I had never made the connection with Nightwing, Darkwing. It was like, that's perfect, except I want to put Duck with it because Darkwing is this cool name who he thinks he is. And then the duck makes it sillier. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't like, oh yeah, there's Darkwing Duck. And then, you know, these are the other ones. It was like Darkwing Duck and a bunch of garbage. <laughs> Just something that, you know, as you're going through all the things, you go, oh God, what are we going to do? Um, anyway, Alan, we have, my joke is we warmed Alan up with the Duck Knight before he left and went to Warner Brothers. And of course became the story editor on the original, you know, the Bruce Tim, uh, Eric Radomsky version of the animated Batman. So he, the Duck Knight led to the Dark Knight. Uh, so <laughs> that was, that was awesome. We got the name out of it. So, you know, when I worked with the guys on the new DuckTales, uh, I would just go in and chat with them in the earliest meeting because Frank Angonis, the co-producer of the show, huge Darkwing fan, was like Darkwing for Halloween. Mm -hmm. two or three Halloweens in a row, did a book re book report on Darkwing Duck. Um, he said, no, Ted, we know, because he said, we are thinking of bringing him into the series. And he said, oh, no, Ted, we know that Darkwing is not Darkwing, it's a, unless it's a story of a father and a daughter and a launch pad. That's what makes the show. Um, so he got it, you know, that's what went through. Um, so that's basically, it wasn't me being hit with a bolt out of the blue. It was this process that started with Jeffrey, uh, a spy, which still worked. Um, oh, that's the other thing. With the name change, what released me from was all the spy stuff. Mm -hmm. We could do it as an excuse to get a different kind of a mission and kind of explain away how does Darkwing afford all his gadgets. Yeah. Um, but the... Uh, it really allowed me to go hard with the comics I grew up with in the late 50s and 60s, which is the Silver Age of comics, you know, especially before Marvel came in, although there's plenty of Marvel stuff we use, but it was just a goofy time in comics. There was little or no continuity. Um, there was no, it was just comic book science as far as, you know, oh, Jimmy Olsen's going to turn into a 50 foot turtle boy is the one I always, you know, talk about because such a cover a lot of flash covers uh i remembered and luckily the internet was around but not um not as wide nor as graphically oriented you know that came god i want to say toward the end of darkwing or not even then it was mostly a text-based screen that you were looking at um so i couldn't go research covers because my my fear if i had done that i would I'd either say that and it's like, I don't want to steal that. So it would be all this rich stuff that I would feel like I'd have to avoid. Yeah. Um, so, but I was just half remembering stuff. So uh, that was, that's what I love. So I brought that element into it and, uh, you know, drove, and now I let the fans create the continuity themselves because they say, oh, Darkwing's, you know, origin, you know, he went to high school with Megavolt. I said, well, in that episode, he did. In this episode, he came from another planet. <laughs> or this episode, he, you know, whatever. We gave him like at least six origins through this series. And fans say, well, that's not the real one. It's like, because you don't think it's the real one, you know. I always, I always avoided telling his origin because um, we didn't want to deal with dead parents. You know, you can't do the Batman origin. <laughs> you can't. And, and Batman's famous scene when he was Bruce Wayne, um, the classic comics is him thinking like, I need a symbol to drive fear into the hearts of criminals. You know, I need some sort of symbol. And a bat cry, crashes through the window, you know. So what? Darkwing's going to sit there and a duck is going to crash through the window. He goes, that's it. I shall become a... Wait. Um... <laughs> It just didn't leave. So to me, the interesting story and really to the heart of the show isn't about how he became this crime fighter um, because he didn't have superpowers to explain away. It was just a matter of, what, did you do it on your own? Did you get money from somewhere? Whatever, were you rich? It was a story of what if Batman had a little girl yeah. who refused to stay home? That's pretty much it in a nutshell. It's more about that dynamic um 
and uh, how broad those personalities are that um, made the show. And people still talk to me about at conventions and online. And podcasts, here we are, you know what I mean? It's, oh, yeah. it, it really struck a chord with a lot of, a lot, <clears throat> with a lot of us and a lot of fans all around the world. And it was something, looking at it as a, as a dad now, right? Looking at the two relationship and then you've got Launchpad. So he's like that crazy uncle that comes in or your crazy brother that comes in and he's, it's life really, right? You look at it like, yeah. this could really happen. I mean, obviously not with ducks and shit, but I mean, it's, this, this could happen. Like somebody could be a crime fighter and he's like, oh shit, I got to get to, I got to get home. I got to make this kid pancakes in the morning. I got to get him ready for school and I got to get a couple hours yeah. before I go back out and fight, uh, fight crime. Excuse me, because I messed up. I miss, uh, miss, up, miss up some words, but uh, it's like it could it could happen, right? So it 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 kind of blurred the lines between reality and 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 what we would, we would see as fake. But as a kid, I'm just sitting there. I'm like, dude, he's so cool. I mean, he just he he has all of these these. You said it yourself. He doesn't have superpowers, but he has all of these abilities. But he has this little little person he's trying to take care of and he's got this moral compass that he has to go back and forth with and then you see all of this crazy shit happen and that's why it clicked with me more now as an adult than it did with a kid because having a kid i'm like i'm sitting here thinking if i had to go out and fight crime but i had to be back before bedtime how the hell does this work because you don't really have time to bend you have to make it within certain parameters and no yeah. villain is going to sit and be like hey man i gotta wrap this shit up man i gotta go put my kid to sleep you know so <laughs> yeah. it just the whole thing of it being an animated cartoon and you see, you see how silly it is and you see how fun it is. It's just, that's why it's, like I said, that's why it still resonates with us as fans so many decades later. Um, yeah. I mean, when Batman was created, well, not when it was created, but when they brought Robin in, Robin was, I believe nine years old. Yeah. So it's like, yes, I leap across rooftops. I deal with these maniacs. I do all this. What I need is a nine year old in short <laughs> pants. Yeah. That's gonna make it. Those were the uh, worst pants and comic. Those that was the worst costume. Like I'll show you real. I don't want to really want to show you because it's, it's a fucking mess down there. But I'm I'm reorganizing all my comics. So you see my boards right here, um, which is taking up quite a bit of the space back there. But like all of my trays and shit are back there. So I'm gonna when you started talking comics and as soon as we started this and I saw the the comics book in the back, I was like, oh shit, we're gonna get along. Like yeah. two old friends, I'm <laughs> a huge comic book. But Dick Grayson had the worst costume in comic book in my opinion at least just those short shorts i mean it was horrendous like you got to tell me well, that it's like um actually i mean the whole superman wearing his underwear on the outside um That's that practical. came from if you look at circus strongmen they would have those leotards and and they would basically have that on the outside that was the kind of the look that they would use in circus and strongmen you see it in old tv sh or old movie you know shorts or Abbott Costello or whatever you know um so that's where that came from and Dick Grayson came from acrobats but I think part of that was just the idea that oh we gotta show it's always hard to draw kids in comics you yeah. know we, especially certain years artists still struggle with you put one line under an eye and suddenly he's an old man uh, and I think the short pants maybe came from that instead of like Maybe it was a coloring mistake. I don't know. <laughs> when you think of it, it's just like Batman. Batman basically is wearing the same thing, except his legs are colored blue. So yeah. who's to say that wasn't a makeup job? Maybe that's what it was, but it just seems so impractical, especially if they were to go against Mr. Freeze. I mean, I got to imagine it's pretty fucking cold in Gotham. And then you're sitting around here wearing booty. You're wearing Daisy Dukes. Before Daisy Dukes you know what I mean? Um, well, you know, I'm not one to talk because, you know, I got a couple of ducks who don't wear pants at all. So. <laughs> practical you know what i mean yeah, yeah. Your pants <laughs> i don't know launch pad you just want to see him walk in the room and kind of look at them going whoa okay <laughs> they're a little more familiar than i was ready for <laughs> you brought up uh, one thing earlier i want to circle back to and it, it has to do with launch pad you said launch jeffrey katzenberg said he, it couldn't be launch pad i mean yeah. him, you know double o duck back in the day before it was darkwing duck it could yeah. not be launch pad uh was there any any else or shit man was there anything else that they said hey we do not want this or did you guys pretty much get free reign with the exception no that was we had free reign uh because you the whole point is you don't put clamps on people at the beginning you let them do whatever they want and then if they go astray you can you can say oh okay this isn't 
this isn't quite working. You want to you want to give guidance in development if you do it right, not not get to the point where the person feels like micromanage. Why don't you do the show? Because you're evidently in charge. Um, no, it launchpad, and that was the reason why it couldn't be launchpad. It was just simply like no, the the goal was to create a new character to carry a series, not to even though. I don't like to think of Darkwing as a spinoff of DuckTales, although in one sense, marketing mostly, it is. Yeah. Um, but it's got a whole, and I <laughs> drives fans crazy when I say it's got a whole different universe vibe in that um, if you drop a safe on Uncle Scrooge, you end up with a mess on the sidewalk. Yeah. And it's not going to get up. If you drop it on Darkwing, you get an accordion kind of Darkwing, you know, coming out of the safe or something with his teeth falling out like piano keys, teeth that he didn't have in the prior scene. Um, so it's a, and when we use characters from DuckTales, I, you know, it, we didn't go back and, well, how, what's his personality like in DuckTales? Maybe some of the writers did, you know, specifically, but. I and mean, we redesigned Launchpad, we changed his IQ, and we made him a great pilot instead of a terrible pilot. So, um, and then when the new DuckTales came, they made him even dumber and made him a worse pilot. Um, so it's all different incarnations, you know, of the characters. But uh, no, we weren't given limitations. It was, it was like, you know, do what you do. So you just have to get over that hurdle of coming up with a concept they think will sell. And then my boss would really look at scripts and pick them apart, um, like the first three episodes. And then he had the rest of the department to run and they were on our own. And then when footage came back, you'd kind of get another, like, this is how we wanted it to be. And luckily our uh, Australian studio, and I wish I had had more episodes by them, but they were still a very small place then, uh, did our first episode they didn't finish the first episode, but they sent a full pencil test of it, which I love watching. And it was fantastic animation. That episode is that sinking feeling, which is the real pilot of the show in that it was the script that I wrote to show all the other writers and story editors. Um, this is the vibe of the show. And there are things that I did in that show that I, we didn't do enough of one of the things in, in an act three, they're suddenly they're in a baseball stadium uh, and suddenly they're in baseball uni uniforms playing pickle with the Moliardi, the villain in the center. Uh, we didn't explain where the uniforms came from. It was that old, you know, Bugs Bunny go, going through a door, coming in dressed in drag, you know, or, or suddenly being dressed as an umpire, you know. Um, that's the kind of vibe that craziness you know, that I want to do and that Darkwing was supposed to be, you know, have comedy adventure storytelling, have Disney heart, but the humorous sensibility was like a short subject, just made 22 minutes. So, you know, that's the vibe I was going for. So um, that really was, you know, when that came back, everybody relaxed, like, oh, this is really funny. <laughs> People were actually laughing out loud. Um, so that gave me a lot of leeway for the rest of the show. When you guys test that pilot, now <clears throat> well, we, we didn't test pilots. You didn't test it, pilots. It was, a, it was a different world back then. Let me tell you something about animation back then. I'll go to network animation because that's okay. where the biggest change is. Uh, because it comes down to today, network executive is both within a studio and at a network or syndication level, whatever. Whoever, whoever's playing the bill, um, they're trying to cover their butts. They're trying to test and examine and do all that as much as they can. Um, when I started TV animation, I was like pitching gummy bear episodes, whatever the show, you would go into a network meeting and you'd have often just three cards, a character lineup, a title card, and maybe a group shot or an action shot that kind of symbolizes the kind of show it's supposed to be, whether it's a pie in the face or an action adventure, or whatever. And then you talk and you talk for about eight minutes is your good length for a pitch. And then if they start asking questions, that's great. That means they're involved and it may go longer, 
but they know that this is the early stages where it's most flexible. Based on that, three pieces of art, one being a title card with maybe the character on the card too, um, your mouth and a discussion, based on that, they would give you uh, either say no or a green light to have a script done, a Bible and a Bible written. Um, and then once you read, they read the Bible, which may have more artwork in it because you, you do it, you, you do the Bible for the, the crew, I mean, as well as the executives and all that. Um, so you fill it with a bunch of artwork to give the feeling of the show that you're trying to do and the characters possible and all that. Um, based on that Bible and the script, you get a green light or not to go on the air. Now it is every step of the way. It's like, okay, I need a write up for your show. No, not a Bible. We don't want to pay for a Bible. We want a, you know, a short little thing. In other words, they want something for free. Uh, and then you have the Bible and then they discuss that and they have notes on that. And then you can do this, the script. And a lot of times, yeah, you write a Bible in a vacuum and it's not until you start working with the script that you realize, oh, that's not working the way I thought it was. I mean, Rescue Rangers had two examples. Zipper the Fly, he was such a cute character. My partner, Alan Zaslav said, he's gonna steal the show. He's so cute, he's so adorable. Uh, because all, he just did little noises and um, you know, he was, had a great attitude, but so it sounded great. But what we found is because he doesn't talk and because he can't really do anything except spy ahead like a drone or something like that, he can't carry anything we didn't have a role for him. And there were times that I just told the storyboard guys saying, hey, fit the zipper in as much as you can if you find little gags or, or include them in a group or have them hovering next to a character, you know, go ahead and do it. Uh, so we tried that. I mean, we tried getting him in there, but that was something that just didn't go as expected as soon as we started writing scripts. Another character we had was, uh, I wanna so, he ended up being a whole different character, Suarez de Bergerac, but I think he was just called Sewer Al. Sewer Nose Al. He was a giant alligator who lived in the sewers, huge, way overweight, but a lot of that was muscle and all that. Uh, and he was brilliant. Uh, he was always reading and stuff like that. People would pay him off in books and things like that. Um, he was so formidable, so it was like, oh, great character. But he was so formidable, we couldn't really use him because it's like we didn't have a, he was too powerful unless we put him in as, a, oh, he's a good source of information. But in 22 minutes, that's just eating a whole bunch of time. It's better for our guys to find out the information. It's more interesting to see our detectives find out that as opposed to going to some easy source of information. So both those things, unseen in Bible, but you need to fill it out in the script. So today the script then gets judged and noted and all of that. And they want several premises. Give me some other shows to episodes. So again, you don't have a show yet, but they're looking for ideas for like another four or five, you know, episodes or stories anyway. Um, and then they want to see if you're, if it's going well, then you do an animatic. Now animatics used to be called story reels when I was at features it's, used to be just storyboards put to the soundtrack. Um, but then as technology progressed, you started to put in more, the guys wanted to put in little flares, little extra um, anticipation instead of just a still pose that says punch. They want, well, let me do two drawings and one will be back and one will be the punch. Um, and you get to the point where you're kind of animating, not animating. I storyboarded on Bob's Burgers and um, I had a scene where Bob is drunk in the kitchen and they had to cut out drawings of mine because my storyboard reel was more animated than the style of the show. Yeah. Um, so, and now it's like you add color to it and again, technology advanced and that often they do. In fact, Disney, I don't know if they still do this for like their Disney Junior stuff, they would do another step. They create a whole another step called the storybook where you 
basically draw an adventure of, a, of the show in a picture book. And they have people reading to test audiences of kids, which I think is useless in a lot of ways. The biggest one is a kid being read to by an adult and being shown pictures. It is an entirely different experience to that kid oh, yeah. than a TV playing in the background and the dog barking and mom saying, have you done your homework yet or whatever it is. But anyway, they threw in that other step. And then there's like a fully animated thing that goes out and gets tested and your fing fingers are crossed how that goes. So that's my rant that I haven't done before I think, on what was basically an era where you basically trusted that there are talented people to do things and the realization that, you know, the biggest deal of this series is the concept. It's going to be, do I want to see a village of blue Smurf people who live under mushrooms and it's a magical world and there's this and, oh, it's based on these comics. You make your decision on that, not the nuance of dialogue that some you're going to say, I can give those notes when the scripts come out, but this is, I either think this is going to be a successful show or not. Um, so these days it's like they want, they want proof and just as many shows go on the air and get killed and all of that now as there were back then, but it just cost a lot less and it was a lot faster back then. So anyway, so no, we did not test Darkwing. That's crazy because it <clears throat> it brought it brought up because I've had a few creators on here, one being Craig McCracken, and he created the Powerpuff Girls. He's also doing Kid oh. Cosmic over at Netflix. I uh, love Kid Cosmic. That is such a great show. And in phenomenal. fact, the third season, is, well, by the time this is out, maybe it's on the air. I think. Yeah, I think it comes out. Wait. I think it's like February fourth or February fourteenth, somewhere around there. Yeah, I'm pretty sure somebody will tell me I'm wrong, but um, it, it's it's so fun. It, like my son and I watch that. My oldest son and I watch that. Um, and it's, I love, and when I, when I had Craig on, I told him what I love most. And I was like, I don't want it to sound like I'm dogging anything else. Anybody else does on that show. I love the backgrounds. The backgrounds are beautiful. Like I was watching the show, but my kid was like, that was funny, huh? And I was like, what was funny? He was like, you were watching the same show I was watching. I was like, yeah, yeah. But I, I zoned out on the backgrounds because the backgrounds <laughs> are just so fun. I mean, the colors, the style. And then he went into detail. He's like, why you like that is because of this artist and all. And he, you know, he went a little bit into detail on, on what they were Does doing. Does your kid ever look at you and say, dad, you're such a geek. Jeez. <laughs> Lighten up and watch the show. He, he calls me, he calls me a nerd all the time. And especially like, uh, well, if you're telling them you didn't watch the show because you zoned out on the backgrounds, he's got an argument there. He really does. But, but it was like, it was just, I was just drawn to it. I was like, man, that's really, really cool. And then I, I was like, I'd have to wait until he went away so I could rewatch the episode so we could talk about it. So he wouldn't make fun of me for rewatching it. <laughs> um, he, He's he's for a twelve year old man. He's he's funny as shit, man. He he'll poke he'll poke at me and he'll he'll make fun of me. Like we went and seen. Um, you ever seen Into the Spider Verse that the Spider Man movie a few years back? Yeah. Yep. So that yeah. the whole scene with Miles Morales and 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 Stan Lee in there. And this is right after Stan Lee died. Um, we're in the movie theater and then it's it's Miles Morales saying, "I don't know if I'm ready for a mask or I don't know when I'll wear a mask or when I'll need a mask." And he's like, "Oh, Stan was like, oh, you'll know when you know, kid. You'll grow into it, type of thing." And I'm like, "Oh shit, you know, I'm starting to tear up." And uh, my son's looking over at me. He's like, Dad, are you crying? I'm like, shut up, man. Watch the movie. I don't want anybody to know I'm sitting here crying at a fucking kid's movie. And he was like, you're crying, though. I'm like, shut up. You're going to get us both kicked out of here. And then as soon as we walk, we we'll walk out. We're talking about the movie. Anytime we watch a movie, the first thing we ask is like, what do you like the most? What do you like the most? And we sit there and compare notes because it's interesting to see what he sees. We can watch the same exact movie or the same exact anything. But to look through a 12 year old, well, he was probably fucking nine at the time to look through a nine year old's eyes at that time, seeing how he sees life or how he sees a situation or a problem resolved or a problem started is so much different than how I see it, because I'm looking at all these components I'm like, oh, man, he's really going to regret that because his body's going to ache the next morning because I'm an adult now. So I know how it feels to get old. You're going to hurt after this. He's just like, oh man, that was pretty cool. He bounced off the wall and he jumped right back up. He's Superman, but he's Spider-Man. Um, so how he looks at it. And then when we get home, you know, the, my wife, Katie was there and she's like, what do you think of the movie? He's like, well, dad cried. And she was like, dude, you just fucking throw me under the bus right out of the gate. You couldn't say the movie was great. You couldn't say this. 
So like I said, he's, he's, he's a little character. Um, but yeah, we, we watched that one together. Kid Cosmic is so fun. But the only reason I brought up that, that original story was because when Powerpuff Girls originally went out, like the show almost didn't happen because it tested poorly and he had to test it twice. And I don't know if you know where I, I know she did. She might have done a little bit of Disney, but I know she was primarily in Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon. But Linda Semensky, I'm pretty sure you know the name or know yeah. the person. So, you know, she, when I had her on, she was telling me like, we had to go to Craig and we had to tell him like, Hey, you got to change. It's got to have heart. It's got to have some, it's got to have some laughs. Make this funny. Like you were working on Dexter, make it funny like Dexter. And they redid some stuff, added some, added some, uh, some dialogues and character development, told them why you should like, you know, the Powerpuff Girls, why you should be invested in these shows. And then the kids were like, Oh, now I get it. It was just, I was missing a part of the equation. So I always like asking that whenever somebody pitches, but you guys didn't pitch anything, so it kind of kind of made it null and void. And I really like that. Uh, why do you think the uh, the industry switched to that? Is you think it's just because of how much money goes into this that they really go in depth yeah. pitches now? I mean, it was weird how much money they gave me if I just woke up in the morning and said, "Oh, I think of a villain, maybe a penguin <laughs> who wants to move to the tropics." I'm buying it. I'm just telling he you right. sweats, so he so he freezes, you know, it's stuff like that. And they say, "Oh, sure, let's spend a million dollars on that or whatever," you know um i mean again everybody it's just so crazy that side of things but it's all the testing is as if it's a sure thing mm -hmm. nobody tries to make bad movies you know yeah yet every year is a bunch of movie flops high budget low budget all of that and there's some outstanding successes um there is no formula except for maybe Hallmark movies. You know, <laughs> they do really lifetime well at the exact same formula. Yeah, lifetime. The way he's going to give, he's going to move to the country, right? Because he's going to give up his business to be with her, and they're going to make a million dollars selling the new wreaths they created together. Yeah, okay. And they open um, a candle business for the sequel, so that's generally how it exactly. goes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Please but don't. But basically, there's there's always that attempt to say, you know, if they could, they'd want to. If they had time machines, <laughs> they would get all the shows done, go to the end, and then say, "Okay, kids, watch all these shows. Do you like them or not?" You know, then come back. Um, that's that's the absolute main reason I think is just trying to, you know, be sure of something. But what's crazy for me is, and again, this was true of Disney. Well, certainly around the time uh, I left was kicked out uh which was what 2003 i believe um i asked about development because they would develop they take pitches from everything with the idea of we're going to develop nine shows get it down to nine shows we believe in which would have different executives in, in charge of them and then they would and I, i'm not sure of my exact number but then they would cut that down to like three would go into you know, or maybe six would go into storyboard, three get full animatics with all the bells and whistles on them. They get tested. Um, you get, you know, seasons where you have these shows and the kids, the testing is like, this one just edges out that one. You know, it's just kind of a gut feeling. We're going to go with this instead of that. Um, and I asked him, I said, okay, so the next year, does the number two one get considered? Oh no, we start again with another nine. Wait, <laughs> so if you had one show that happened to be a fantastic show and that was number one, and you had one that was almost fantastic, and then you, then like nine months later, you start over again and nobody thinks like, what happened to that really great show we had that almost made it? You don't wanna just, it's all done. Why don't you just throw it into the mix again and see how it does with the others? But it's just like no concept of that. The other thing was uh, I pitched a show um, that had a magical men in black kind of feeling, but it was a, uh, and I, when I left Disney, I made sure they gave me back the property. Uh, the pitch was um, when most girls are worried about acne, Emron broke out in wings. And she woke up in the morning and she's got fairy wings. And it turns out, and she's kind of this goth kid. She suddenly got fairy wings. It turns out her father, who's gone, being raised by her hippie-ish mom, uh, was a fairy. Not only was he a fairy, 
he was actually a prince of the fairy kingdom. And she goes, I'm a fairy princess? So anyway, she gets doctrinated in the whole world. It's like she discovers that lineage. Um, they also had a, a show in development that they had just approved. I want to say, and I had done this all in my own time, where the other was developed with more official stuff, um, American Dragon, uh, oh. where a kid finds out he's a dragon. Yeah. And they felt like, those things are too close. I said, but they're entirely different shows because she goes on adventures with her uncle and they become, you realize there's a balance between worlds and why, like Bigfoot, there's no such thing as Bigfoot. They're actually trolls dressed up in furry costumes so they can steal s'mores from Girl Scouts and scare them away. Um, you know, just goofy stuff like that. Uh, so it's an entirely different show. And they said, we really like this, but we have this other thing already. And I, I said, it's a whole different show. Why not develop both if you like them? And it's like, no, in their mind, we have this show that's a fairy niche. Even though you know you're only going to do one show at the end of the day, the fact that two had similar concepts and American Dragon went through rework. That was the first time it was pitched. And they went through reworking, reworking. It was really the one executive who was in charge of that wouldn't let it die and really pushed it and finally got it on the air. And it didn't do that well. It did two seasons, I think. Um, How about Jake? Not to put down the show because I thought it was a cool show. But it was that thing of, it wasn't like it was a sure thing and you didn't develop this other thing you really liked just because you thought it was similar, even though you look at all the particulars and they're totally different. So again, strange judgments in, in development. When I do my shows, um, now you're talking about development of stories and episodes within the show. Um, my point was always hire a bunch of really talented people and trust that they're gonna be talented on and you know, add your ideas at every stage. You know, I was one of those, I was an artist and a writer so I could contribute to both sides of things. Um, and that's, to me, I felt like that was my job within the show. My other job was to protect my crew from management mm -hmm. and that I built a moat around them. And uh, it was funny when Alan Zaslov, uh, who had done, he had started on DuckTales and then came with me on Rescue Rangers and Darkwing Duck. And um, when we, when he went on other shows and I, went and did well, I was doing uh direct home videos that's when we didn't split up because we weren't an actual partnership I mean we'd met on the job and just worked on shows together um he came to me once and he was Alan was great connecting with the you know everybody on the crew but he kind of sat down with me and just said I went to these meetings and the notes were like this and that and that I said yeah Alan what do you think I've been protecting you from for the last four years, you know, um, and we had, I mean, executives come and go, but um, we generally had good people. They were doing a good job. It was one of those things, though, that everyone wants to build a kingdom, so you have to have people under you, and it's a self-fulfilling kind of thing, you know, um, instead of going back to the old days, hey, what if you just really believe in the idea, and let's skip through this process, or how much of if I'm doing a network show or if if I'm dealing with a network or syndication or a Disney channel, somebody who has the final say, how many roadblocks should be in my way within the studio? Why am I getting all these notes? And this didn't affect me because we were doing it for syndication. Basically, as soon as we had a show, they had to put it on. Um, but it's like, um, why am I getting all these particular notes if they can't say yes, basically. And that was even a problem. I watched it on the direct-to-video side. Um, there, were, there was a, a, a time when somebody got sick or something and somebody was on maternity leave. So the head person worked with the producer directly mm -hmm. and it went through the script process and all that. And she goes, why did this go so early, How, so easy? And he said, because I'm working directly with you. It's like, if you get all these notes from somebody, even though they think they know the taste of the person above them, 
they don't, you know, or they think they do, but you've got to, on the, the more micro you get, the more variation there is. Um, you know, he said, I'm working with you directly. So that's why it goes smoother. And she goes, oh, person comes back, no lessons learned. It's kind of like you should be, it would be great to say, hey, I don't need a person in this category. I just need to make time. So I need someone to take over this and this, and then I'm going to be more involved or something. And it's like, that didn't happen. It's like, you know, there's a reason why. So the fact that you have those levels and then you have to go to a, a network or something is crazy. Now, the world of television has changed because you're into streaming and, and channels and they're owned by the same company. But that, unlike back when we did the Disney afternoon and basically syndication basically had to take what we gave them, um, <laughs> except for that, even when it was ABC, I mean, I worked for, pitched to ABC on the second season of Darkwing, actually it was first for ABC, but uh, before they were owned by Disney. But then after they were owned by Disney, or if you're developing for the Disney channel, it's like, those are separate entities within yeah. Disney. Uh, so it's not like people always talk about Disney synergy and of course like that. And we used to sit around saying, I wish Disney had the synergy like people think they do. So all the conspiracy theorists have this one version of Disney. It's like, yeah, I want to work for that one. Because <laughs> here, those people don't know what we're doing and they're screwing things up. You know, It's always interesting to hear everybody's inner workings because I've heard a lot of it was from uh, Linda Semensky, like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, for the, for the fans that are listening that don't know Linda Semensky, shame on you for one. Uh, this this lady is responsible for not coming up with the shows, but making, as, as she liked to put it, she had a sandbox that all these people would play in. And then her goal <clears throat> was, it was, excuse me, I apologize. Uh, her goal was to keep bullies essentially out of the, out of the sandbox. She was the... I don't want to say the, the hostage negotiator, but she was the person that was playing in both worlds. She had the creative yeah. side. She's like, do what you guys do. I will do my job and protect you the best that I can. Don't, you know, make sure you're trying to make as much on time as possible. Do what you're supposed to do type of thing. Don't make me regret this, but I will make sure that I keep out as much interference so you guys can focus on your jobs because I hired you guys like you were talking about. I hired the best people I could possibly hire for them to be as best or as good as they can at their job. You have that that kind of like that two-way street you got to have. You got to have that, here's this handshake deal. I'm bringing you on this team. I need you to do what you say you can do and be awesome. And that's what yeah. she, would, she would talk about. She would highlight that there was a lot of kickback for a lot of these shows. And if it wasn't for, you know, Linda Siminski, I hate bringing this up again, but if it wasn't for her, Powerpuff Girls don't get made. You know, she had to yeah. essentially put her career on the line. She's like, no, I believe in this. This is this is something that we need to hit. We haven't hit this market. There's a whole bunch of shows for little boys, but there's not a whole bunch of shows for little girls. And for the longest time, <clears throat> God damn, I can't I can't get my, my throat to clear for, for some reason today. But for the longest time, like I had to talk my friends into watching Powerpuff Girls when we were younger. You know, 10, 12 years old, I think, is when I started watching uh, Powerpuff Girls. But trying to convince 10 year old boys to watch a show that was featuring three girls was difficult. And then you see Fuzzy Lumpkins, which was my favorite, which also was the voice for Jim Cummings. Uh, and you know, you had Mojo Jojo, which was another fantastic. So once, once it kind of broke through and I could say like, no, 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 watch the show. It was a little bit easier. Um, but a lot of people forget you have to have that person that's willing to go to bat for you and say, Hey, I'll, I'll take this on type of thing. I'll make sure I go to bat for you. Cause most people at the end of the day, when, when it really hits, when the shit really hits the fan, you're looking around for that one person like, Oh man, that, that fucker said he had my back. Where, where is he? And then he's just yeah. on the other side now, you know? So it's, it's definitely difficult, man. I, I saw, I, I appreciate you stepping up, especially for the, the vision you had for Darkwing Duck, man, you know, so a lot of people would have just followed and did what the network said to do because they're signing your checks. A lot of people want, yes, man, I want the man or woman that'll say yes, but, or no, we can't, you know, I like that type of people. I like that dynamic. Um, when you get a room well, from also Darkwing had 91 episodes mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't understand these days, like <clears throat> SpongeBob, as long as you're successful, they keep making them, you know, yeah. like that. Uh, famously Scooby-Doo, <laughs> probably the longest running character series or between series and movies i think he's constantly been in production since he yeah. was created uh, years started so yeah um anyway the the 
when you go to talk about Powerpuff Girls and people believing in them, um, it, it is that thing somebody has to see the spark yes. and say, this is the way to move forward and all that, you know? Um, and it's, it's with, you know, at Disney, generally we had people who did that. And uh, there were a couple of times there weren't. There was one, one time that, that um, God, I remember an executive telling me and Bob Scully and Mark McCorkle, who I did Hercules and Buzz Lightyear with. Yeah. Um, uh, and we got, we had one executive, one president of TV, and then another guy took over. Mm -hmm. And the new guy, he, you know, this mid-level executive has said, um, you know, you guys get away with so much. He, he inexplicably likes you guys as much as the last guy hated you. Yeah. And we went, wait, the last guy hated us? And luckily we were all in the middle of contracts. Fuck, it's news to me. Just like, what? <laughs> you know, <I> could, what? <laughs> so it was, uh, thank God for those contracts. Uh, but I mean, again, it, it has to be somebody and you don't know, you just hit someone the wrong way or you have a meeting. And I, a couple of times in my career, I've had meetings or correspondence with somebody. And because of something I just came off of, I'm hitting them in a whole bizarre way that, that if I was them, I would go, woo, you know, or, or, oh, he's too full of himself or, or whatever. So uh, who knows? <laughs> so there's a couple of things I want to hit on before we get to the fans questions. Uh, I don't want to keep you too, too much longer. Cause I'm pretty sure you got more important shit to do than talk to me. Uh, but I've been having a lot of fun with this talk, man. I, I never know what to expect when I have people on, it can go one of two ways. And this is a really fun way. So I, I, I appreciate seeing really how the sausage is made when it comes to you guys. Cause I'm an outsider when it comes to this, I'm just a fan at the end of the day. I love seeing what you guys do. Um, like I told you before we hit record, man, this, these shows, you know, growing up from Darkwing to Chippendale, I mean, without Chippendale, I don't try Monterey Jack cheese. That's my favorite cheese in the world. You know what I mean? So it's, I, I, love that because i saw that i heard them talking about it so i was like man i've only had american cheese you know being like eight year old i'm seven year old i've only had american cheese in my life or maybe swiss if i wanted to get fancy once or twice but i was like what is this monterey jack cheese that everybody keeps talking about so i go out and try it and it's my favorite cheese i, I love there you, stuff. Go. you know without tad i don't I, my I need cheese. free monterey jack cheese the rest of my life <laughs> you should yeah, be man craft like should be reaching it's out funny i i I recently did a uh, podcast with some Australian friends of mine, and um, they pointed out that there is no Monterey Jack cheese in Australia. It's really? Just, that's a that's an American thing, you know. It's just, bullshit. <laughs> just does it does not exist out there, you know. And you know, you hear of English cheese. Well, now everybody hears about everything, but it was kind of like growing up. They said, "What's Monterey Jack?" And I said, "Well, luckily his character didn't." depend on his you didn't get like superpowers by eating it wasn't, Monterey Jack it wasn't like Popeye and spinach or anything yeah it's wild man uh so you know without that I don't see that I mean without that you know I I've told the story once but I want to tell it to you again because I think it I think it, it it needs to be told really so when I was a little bit younger my mom had this uh this guy that ended up being my stepdad and he was a very I don't want to say straight laced kind of guy, but he had this opinion on boys did one thing, girls did one thing, right? So me, I loved color growing up. I, that's why I love, love that painting back there. I love seeing all of those colors. It's just life is color, right? So Darkwing Duck made purple so fucking cool. And I don't want to go too deep into, into purple because there is actually a fan's question. I don't want to see like I'm poaching this guy's question, but it wasn't until... I see Darkwing Duck and my fans, or not my fans, because I didn't have fans at eight years old. I had my parents. Um, but it wasn't until I see Darkwing Duck and my friends were watching this that I'm like, oh shit, he's cool as fuck and he wears purple. I was like, man, that's such a cool color. You know, so it it really opened up my eyes into this this thing where that, that the step that I was telling you about. You, you, you know, if you're a boy, you like blue, you like red, you like green, you can't like yellow. I got a yellow phone here, man. I, I, like I said, I love color, I love brightness. Um, it's fun. Like Tragically, uh, years later, he found out his stepfather was colorblind. <laughs> that seems like a Dark and Duck episode right there, man. Maybe we should make that happen. Yeah. It's like those uh, on YouTube where they put on those glasses that yeah. suddenly people can see color for the first time. You got him some of those. Son, I love you. <laughs> so you might have been less of an asshole at that point, but. Uh... Man, maybe I should really start to look at those are different glasses. Yeah, yeah, non-asshole glasses. <laughs> yeah, uh, but yeah. So you know, 
but you know it, it, like I said it, it made me enjoy and made it okay I guess for me to think in my head like oh man I don't have to do what this guy, guy tells me to do I don't have to sit here and think one way or the other I can think for myself because I see all these other people wearing that color I see these other people doing this thing it's not exclusive to one person or one gender or one race so you know that show helped me kind of like bridge the gap to like I said it's something stupid and it's something simple like wearing the color purple but just back hey, in the day hey, I when I retired, it coincided with the first time I was invited to a convention as a guest. I mean, I had been on panels at convention, but generally it was something related to Disney or Disney sent us down, or I went to a convention as a fan. But I was a, I got a free table and lodging and transportation and all that. Uh, I had nothing to sell. So that's when I started doing original artwork of Darkwing. And uh, I got much better at drawing them. And some of my, some of my storyboard artists say, "Wow, you draw much better now." I say, "Yeah, maybe I should have done this back when I was actually doing the show." Um, anyway, in selling that original art and you know having big banner, but actually back then I didn't even have a banner. I mean, people coming up and talking to me. In that first convention, I had three, possibly four separate people. Two broke down and cried. Yeah. Two, two women who said. And it was never saw this coming in a million years. We intentionally made Darkwing and Goslin like each other and say they loved each other and they hugged. That was literally orders from me because their personalities were so abrasive and crazy. We had to show, no, he'd do anything for her, you know. Yeah. Um, that bonding in the show, even though I thought the show being full of gags and all of that basically was an anchor for these women who came up and came from broken homes either dad had left or, or dad was a jerk or abusive or stuff like that um and they found each other and became great friends and all that and i was i was shocked at that sort of thing um and a guy got misty eyed although he didn't tell me you know the background of it and then the on a sunday a dealer came over and she said i just have to say that growing up i was never into cartoons which I'm thinking, that's a nice thing to say to an animation guy with a bunch of cartoons on his desk. Um, <laughs> but she said, except for Darkwing Duck, I don't know what it was about the guy. And then I was, because it was still fresh in my mind, I told her about the, the experience I had had the day before with those people. And she said, huh, maybe that's why. And it was like, <laughs> I didn't ask questions, but it's like, sorry, you had a crappy life. <laughs> that I could help, you know, but it just shows that you, know, you grow up with these parts of pop culture, yeah. And if you really do them as crazy as Darkwing is, you give it something relatable, something that's that really touch you, that characters who care about each other. It really influences people, you know. I'm sure positively and negatively, you know, from different shows. So. Um, yeah, I never heard fashion choices being opened up by Darkwing, but uh, yeah, my hats got much bigger after that. So. <laughs> nah, he's, he, he was a douchebag anyways, man. But like I said, I, I've gotten to hear some of the, some of, I don't want to say they're, they're tragic, but at the end of the tragic, they, they were cool. Like one of the coolest things, but it's also one of the saddest things, and it made me tear up quite a bit. Um, Cheryl Chase, she was the voice of Angelica Pickles on the Rugrats on Nickelodeon. She had this story uh, that she shared with me and uh, I, I legitimately, like I looked at her and I'm, I'm not a religious person. I told you we don't talk religion or politics on the show, but I looked at her and I, and I didn't mean anything by it being religious, but I was like, you're doing the Lord's work. When, and when I tell you the story, you'll understand. But she had had this, uh, this, this fan of the show and he was, he had leukemia. I, I can't, I'm pretty sure it was a little boy, but he had, I think he had leukemia. And he was he was essentially dying, right? So it was the Make a Wish Foundation type of thing, and uh, his sole wish was to talk to Angelica Pickles. Angelica Pickles was his favorite character. Rugrats was his favorite show. He absolutely loved everything about this show. He was a little boy and he's dying, and then she called, and then they sang story or they sang songs, and they talked, you know, and she talked to him, and he talked to her, and then just hearing the stories that you guys hear, like it, it is. It is, I know it can be tough 
for when fans like myself, because you guys don't ask to be burdened down with, with the stories that I'm sure you've heard, whether it's, you know, mm -hmm. abusive father or an abusive mother or a non-existing mother or father or an abusive brother, or I was molested or this, that, or the other. And then the one thing that got me through all of that was X, Y, and Z for you being Darkwing Duck. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can only imagine, you know, the amazing stories, but also the tragic stories you've heard and, and how much that's, that's, that the shows touch so many people in so many different ways. So I got to imagine, like I said, even though you guys don't ask for, you know, this burden that people try to unload on you or tell you why they love you and love your work for, for you know, for so many different reasons. But I got to imagine at the end of the day, it's got to feel really good that, you know, you were just doing, and so many people say this, but you guys were just doing a job at the end of the day. You guys were making shows. This is your profession. This was your craft that you guys were trying to master. And through that, you spoke to people. And that's, that's, that's what creating a fan base really is. That's what's creating something that will outlive, you know, yourself or outlive whoever. It will stand the test of time because at the end of the day, it meant something so much to somebody. You know, so I got to imagine at the end of the day when Tad, when you lay down your head, you're like, fuck, man, I did something cool, man. I made this character. But not only did I make this character, it resonated with millions of people. Well, yeah. And plus, I one of the last conventions I did was actually in Moscow. <clears throat> and in Russia, um, DuckTales, Rescue Ranger and Darkwing were like the first Western and I think Turtles, too. Yeah. Um, although maybe not at the exact same time, but were like the first western cartoons to play in russia mm -hmm. after the fall of the soviet union and the thing you have to realize is before then they had no cartoons like that at all their animation was generally russian folk tales yeah. that were no just fairy tales yeah. folk tales uh told creatively but with very limited animation and suddenly these other new worlds come across but because they were only cartoons on I and I didn't realize this going in. The guys kept a comics company, Bubble Comics, brought me over, and they they were saying, "Well, we we think you should do three hours of this and three hours of that." And I'm thinking from my American experience, I said, "You know, I get like eight people at my table. I mean, it's constant; they keep coming, but it's not. You know, don't you want me to do it this way?" And and the, I'm going back and forth through emails until finally I just said, "Look, you guys know your fans and everything." I just put it in your hands. I'll do anything you want. And I was like thousands of miles away. I could sense the relief. Uh, I had no clue because every child of that generation, every child saw my shows. Yeah. Uh, and they would see them on the weekends on the Disney club. Um, and then they would be sold as videotapes illegally, but that's just the way yeah. television worked in Russia. Uh, in kiosks in Red Square and elsewhere, and kids would watch those tapes over and over and over again. So I had people, uh, Batgirl, <laughs> great costume, wonderful person. I saw her, and then it's like she swooped in, handed me a box of, box of chocolate. I said, well, thank you, and then she's gone, and it's because she got in line. She claimed she was in line for five hours. Mm -hmm. I said, five hours? They gave me like two hours for lunch, an hour to eat, and an hour just to do an interview or whatever. Um, and it was just, and finally, last day, I said, can you give the guy my phone? I said, could you get pictures and all that? He took a video from the back of the line all the way through, and it's just amazing. But I'm just signing things like crazy. I mean, all my artwork sold immediately, and it was one of those things, like, had I known, <laughs> I would have spent several months doing artwork every day. Um, Anyway, then I had done a variant cover for their for free for their comic, one of their comics, where I turned the hero into a duck and the villain into a bird. Um, so you had me sign those, and then they make black and white posters of those. And I'm signing those, and then I would take a picture with people, you know. And they had made, uh, I give them some of my artwork. They had made a like fifteen, uh, okay, ten foot by maybe 20 or 15 or 20 foot banner behind me of my artwork uh, and my name big. And so I would get up and stand in front of the characters and have pictures taken with them. And for a while they said, you know, it would be better if you didn't give up, get up if you just sign the things and then they come around behind you for a picture. Yeah. And then a couple of people did that before I realized they were being told to do that. And then I said, look, 
not only do I need to get up so I don't <laughs> freeze in position, but when I get up, that's when they talk to me and they say, this meant so much. This is like, and I have fun with them and I took crazy poses with them and stuff, a lot of hugs. <laughs> um, but it was like, that was a real connection. And I came back and I wrote a big long post to my crew because it's like, yeah, you created Darkwing Duck. Yes, but the Darkwing you saw on TV was created by a village, you know, about 80 people who designed and painted and colored and, and, you know, wrote and edited and all of that to do that. I wanted them to know what they had basically given to the world and all that, because animation is not like, it's not like Charles Schultz sitting alone making peanuts and then putting them out there. It's, it's, you know, this creative giant that has to, of many people. And you think of something like, again, Encanto, a fantastic emotional movie where the studio didn't even get to sit together. Those are, that was all done in people's homes, you know? Um, and that was, you know, hundreds of people. You watch those credits go on and on and on. That's what it takes to give you those moments. So I really wanted to share it with my crew because, you know, they're all superstars as far as I was concerned. That's really but yeah, cool. it's cool. But That's now fan questions, come on. Oh, no. That's really beautiful. And that's like I said, that's, this is exactly why I do this podcast, because I love talking to creators, but I love talking board artists. I love talking to writers. I love talking to producers, because like you just said, it takes a village to make these shows. I mean, on any <clears throat> on any one team, you could have as many as 10 to 20 to 40 board artists, just depending on the film, depending on the show, depending on the movie, depending on what you're doing. You could have, like you said, upwards of 80 people on one show you know so it's 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 so vast and everybody has different uh different stories to tell because they had different things that they had different hurdles that they had to jump um so thank you for sharing them and i really appreciate that uh what does it feel like to be huge in russia i i was supposed to go back for darkwing's 30th which was last year yeah. because when you get a visa they always say no get the business visa mm -hmm. i said okay could be just good for three years and so my plan was to go back darkwing's 30th do it again this time i would know do draw a lot more yeah uh and then this thing happened where the world shut down <laughs> it didn't happen. You've got two uh, but it was it, it was great i mean the, the the funny thing one evening i just saw it out the side of my eye and the guys told me about it later and although i met the guys uh two policemen came up mm -hmm. and one guy was like shoulders yeah <laughs> and incredibly handsome and wavy hair. It was just like, who cast you as a cop? You know, <laughs> anyway, he and this other guy go up and talk to the guy. And evidently they said, uh, when do you guys close down? Or they asked something like that. And the guys behind the table are like super nervous. And, and they're saying, oh no, we close when the convention closes, we get everything up, we lock things down, we take certain stuff back and da, 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 da. And they said, no, 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 no. We just wanted an autograph. <laughs> <laughs> and these and they were going to bring them right to the front they said no people hate the police enough to do that although they did uh they didn't want to cut in line but we did anyway i'm sorry i didn't get a pic we took lots of pictures with them but i wish i got one on my camera because again and the guy said to me that's what we mean every kid in that generation watched your shows so it was cool it was like being a rock star it was awesome well maybe if uh Maybe if somebody in Russia sees this, maybe they know the cop. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of handsome young men and young women out there. So they're, <laughs> they're, they're land of beautiful people. I love the food. That's a country I always wanted to go to. When I was in the Navy, that was one that I regret. We, I, I can't remember if we had the chance to go, uh, but I know we had the chance to do was it fucking battle battle i don't know there was a chance where, where the russian navy and, and the and the, the u.s navy were going to be stationed uh roughly around the same area and whenever you get um two com not competing countries but two countries like that with the same force you know you guys would trade uh, like pieces of your uniform like i would take off my hat and i would give it to somebody they would give me their hat or you know i would oh. take off my jacket we would just trade shit you know so I got to do it with the with the the, the royal navy over in britain so that was pretty cool um but fans questions this is one of my favorite parts uh before we get to that how many times have you been mistaken for steve martin that's my fan question because you look a lot like steve martin <laughs> Ooh, that actually at first 
No, no. It, I'm trying to think. Was it in Russia that somebody? They tried to get you. Wasn't to Russia? Somebody gave me a photo of Steve Martin to um, uh, to sign. I think that's what actually happened. And I'm, Did you sign not it? Me, kind of but I signed it and all that. <laughs> but, uh, no, it is not that often. No, well, at least uh, at least me and Russia are simpatico right now. All right, so creative underscore engineer underscore 71. Are you co-producing at all at the Darkwing Duck reboot? I got to imagine no, since we both said, or since you said you were retired earlier, but you co-producing? I'm retired, but I'm a consultant. a consultant. I haven't seen anything yet, so I don't know what they're doing. And then on the Chip and Dale movie, the Rescue Rangers movie, that's, I guess, going to be out in a couple of months in, uh, on Disney+. Plus. Um, I had no involvement at all. Okay. Uh, H1's underscore holy underscore dudeness wants to know, uh, which superheroes influence you the most to create Darkwing Duck? Not in the creation. I mean, Batman was just part of the zeitgeist. I knew it was that area. But like I say, you see more. When I was growing up, Batman, again, in the silly era, had bat copters, bat plane, bat boat, and all that. Darkwing had a boat called the Wave Shredder. And I don't know that we ever used it the reason why saint canard is like surrounded by water is to be an excuse to use the boat we yeah. just never did it um so it was the rat catcher the the uh, the thunder quack and the wave shredder which was our homage to ninja turtles i don't know no it didn't have a ducky enough name i guess um anyway that that kind of everything that's why darkwing's motorcycle looks like his face because that's what batman had he had his face on his car i mean that was the batmobile i grew up with or at least at the beginning was the one with the big bat shaped head on the you know the front um so i certainly took that from he didn't have a utility belt there's things i look at and i say okay why didn't we do more of that um and then um but a lot of it is flash the some of the stories and half again half remembered stories and covers of flash comics where flash is an old man uh i saw one after the show where flash was a marionette i went oh we could have done something with that um you know so we did it was just what i would tell the the story editors is like pitch me the comic book cover mm -hmm. In other words, how, why would somebody pick up this comic book? Well, Jimmy Olsen's a turtle? I'm going to read that. Um, and I said, that way there's going to be a visual image at the center of the episode that is a reason to animate it and, and all that, no matter what the story is going in and out of that. I wanted that, what's the comic cover sort of thing. So Flash comics were a big deal. But again, uh, I didn't, I got into Marvel literally in their, if not the first year of their start, the next year. Mm -hmm. It was about the time when I probably would have progressed out of comics or into more paperback books or whatever. Um, and we went on a vacation and there were, it was at Lake Tahoe and we were staying with my cousins in the like a trailer park they had a camper and we had rented this thing that folded out into a big tent um i went to the general store that was connected to the camp and they had a spinner rack of comics and here are these superheroes i've never seen before that all had this box in the corner showing the character and my two first comics was uh iron man versus the melter and i always forget the number i want to say 37 but something like whatever he's still in the gold armor clunky armor and the other was tales to astonish 49 i want to say and it was the issue where ant-man became giant man and the first page is this don heck beautifully drawn giant man crashing through the bottom of the building because he grew too big and he was experimenting and he, he got so big he couldn't move and 12 feet was like the perfect size um but there was something different about them for the rest of vacation as we went around the lake i always because comics used to be everywhere i'm not in a comic book store because comic book stores didn't exist um i'd always pick up anything with that little box in the corner because it just felt different and i know now that 
it's because they gave personality to characters instead of just being a one note i'm always the nice guy kind of thing it was like what peter parter has he he tries to buy halloween costume so he doesn't have to make his own costume and it shrinks in the rain you know or he has a cold and loses his powers or you know and starts slipping instead of sticking to walls um Without putting my finger on, I just knew it was different. I went home, I showed my friends on the street, and we all began collecting Marvel comics. Um, so, but most of my early childhood was DC in the Silver Age, where it was just like just the craziest stories to get you to pick up that that comic. And uh, so that, in general, had an influence on, on what we did. Are you reading comics now? When, when I say, are you reading comics now? Are you reading anything new now? Um, I don't read, I got rid of my collection. I put on the consignment. My problem is I read my comics. <laughs> so I had a complete set of Fantastic Four from one to whatever. Um, and I bought two copies of Avengers number one for a nickel each, because when I was growing up, the fun of comic collecting was you'd go to a used bookstore mm -hmm. and used bookstores, they'd always have a box full of magazines and comics and they'd be a nickel a piece no matter where you went around and so it was about can you get your parents to take you you're going to a new city can i come along is there a news bookstore there you know um and got two copies of avengers things like that i wish i had picked up enough showcase magazines because there is dc stuff that i would pick up too and i realized boy the flash wasn't that old that was like an early showcase comic i could have gotten a complete set of that because i picked up flash and green lantern i love gil kane as an artist on green lantern and the adam um metal men i would always pick up which really when you look at them are practically a marvel comic because the whole conceit was they had different personalities that would get in the way of the straight adventure um so that was the fun you know collecting to me but i got rid of my comics i put them on consignment so they got decent money yeah. but it's like if somebody's going to spend 800 bucks on a comic they want it in better condition and it wasn't like i fold them up put them in my back pocket i just read them a lot and drew from them and you know trace things and whatever um so now i when i pick up a comic it's digitally um or it's a graphic novel um the newest thing i picked up was um by chris somney um Joanna, mm -hmm. uh, the and the impossible or the impossible Joanna, whatever yeah. combination of those words, Chris Somney and I just it's actually more of a um, mostly without dialogue. I just love his work and he really captures expressions in it, and it's just like a crazy conceit. It's like, oh yeah, I I would do a show based on this, you know, kind of thing. Very easy. He's a fantastic artist. Uh, his yeah, but I haven't I I haven't been a Wednesday Warrior in decades because. I, yes, I've had a great career, except for that year and a half when I couldn't get anybody to hire me. That was a little tough. And during that time, I stopped buying comics regularly at all. Um, and if you, if you have a big comic habit and you wanna stop collecting, try buying them one at a time. Because yeah. when you buy a whole bunch of comics, you say, oh, yeah, I put down 30 or $70 this week or whatever, you know, or much more depending on the type of collector you are. But if you just buy one and it's like $3.99, $4.99, and you read it in less than 10 minutes, and it's just this, what? I for two of these, I could have had a pretty decent lunch. <laughs> you know, it's it's that'll break you of the habit because suddenly you go, right, do I really need this? Do I want that? Um but you know back when i was playing at disney we just we would all go to the comic store and and just inhale the stuff just to have those juices going and it was great because i learned about comic stores when i started disney tv animation mm -hmm. uh, art patel and jim megan created the gummy bears and art was a director um and they say hey we're going to the comic store what's this <laughs> and it's like here i am on ventura boulevard in, in california and, and it was so cool. And then there was a smaller shop near uh, Disney. And it was like right when The Dark Knight hit by Frank Miller, yeah. um, Camelot 3000, um, God, what was the other ones around there? Whatever, it was like the, the prime. Yeah. Yeah, a Walkman. I mean, we used to grab 
and she's a Walkman, go back to the studio, go into each of our offices, you know, read it and then come out. You know, it's like no work got done because then we had to discuss the latest issue of that, you know. Um, so anyway, that's comics influenced a lot as we were doing, but it was not, oh, I'm going to take that from there. It was just inspiration. I mean, one of, one of a writer and story editor I tried using on every show once I started working with was Kevin Hopps. And uh, Kevin and I would do the same thing. You go to, you're developing a show and you go to a comic store and it's like, you want to buy a comic just like the show that's in your head. It doesn't exist because it's in your head, but you're always looking for, is there something? And it's like, no, but you get a lot of surrounding things. And, and it's just, it actually, you get excited by something creatively and then you go back, you work on an original idea and you're, it's that creative. It's not specifics. It is just the creative excitement that you want to create something to. Yeah, it's looking for that spark. The only reason I bring that up is because I, I feel like I should get some kind of kickback from these these two gentlemen in this company because I talk about it every almost every episode when comics come up. This is one you got to check out, right? Oh, yeah, I've got it. Right? You read Probably it? right behind me. Okay, that one's a fantastic one. I always tell everybody that, that you got to watch, you got you to pick this one up. Oh, it's a phenomenal book, man. It's it's so cover, baby. Yeah, it's it's so fun. Like that one, and then they just dropped a new She-Hulk book um, that was really good. It's the the first issue, so it's going to be the new series. And of course, the show. Yeah, I I, I um, again, I don't got comics anymore, but I started listening to and watching I Fanboy mm -hmm. uh, podcast and yeah. met the guys. They're friends of mine back when they had a forum. I was part of it and and. Uh, Kind of a peacekeeper on it um anyway the that i got i listen to them you know every show every sunday because it's just like i know them it's like chatting with my pals and you yeah. realize it's one way they're not keeping up with you, you know, but, <laughs> but, uh, no i still because of them i still knew about the new shoe hulk yeah. you know series and things like that yeah they've got a great podcast man i really enjoy them so shout out to those guys. Um, but yeah, that, that one, that one's a really good one. And uh, so we're going to rotate into the next one. Difficult March 4406. Any other color choices for Darkwing Duck or was it always going to be purple? I'm 40 and to this day, I still associate the color, uh, the color purple with Darkwing Duck. Was there any other colors you had in, uh, in mind? No, because we wanted him to be um unlike robin <laughs> batman wore dark colors yeah. um and it was the idea he's a person of the night so it should be like the shadow but for a cartoon you want it to be or for the feel of the show we wanted it to be brighter mm -hmm. um and it was like okay i need a dark color but it's got to have you know we can go dark dark purple or blue or whatever um and and we've got to pick his shadow colors to be you know Comfort. bright enough to be seen to really pop on the, the thing and so purple was really early on i mean i might have thought about blue and done a sketch or two with with dark blue but it's like purple was unique enough <laughs> there weren't purple guys around that it made more sense to pop a little more okay. uh, uh, SECC1 wants to know, are you going to get dangerous? Every day. Every day. Wake up. Ready to be dangerous. That's how you stay dangerous. <laughs> exactly. Dangerous. Barney Boy. Well, that's how I sign things. I think people get me because I don't write like, let's get dangerous. I assume they're fans. So that's always stay dangerous. <laughs> you know, I assume you're staying dangerous. <laughs> but wear a mask. Um, Barney Boy, this is one of my favorite questions. Uh, Barney Boy 13 wants to know, are there any cereal box Darkwing Duck toy blasters from the late 90s left? I'm still looking for mine. Cereal box ones? Yeah, apparently there was... Literally a... in the cereal box, there were just the... And I don't have any up here. They had the little... God, we went through meeting and meeting. They, the sculptor would come in with the handler with these little wax figures and we'd like give notes on these little things and invariably he would take those notes and would come back back but then he changed something and he said why did you change that no this has not good anyway they put out a set of like four figures and, and stuff like that and hey you got enough money it's all out there i suppose but uh, you gotta stumble on it i have a bunch of darkwing toys in the garage but it is um they were played with i am not one to keep i have one character 
that I kept in a case. From Buzz Lightyear, this is the character I created, I designed, I colored and everything. And then they put out a toy. This is uh, No Spore A2 from uh, Buzz Lightyear, uh, who's a vampire, robot vampire. And in fact, I, I designed him with a point on the bottom. I said, oh, the toy maker's gonna hate that, but they did it anyway, because you just get a little plastic stand to, to stick him in. Um, that's probably the only one I didn't unwrap, although I do have a lot of Hellboy toys that aren't unwrapped just because I have a lot of them. But um, no, generally uh, all that stuff is at our house. We just played with all that stuff. So I have a, I have the gas gun somewhere, but uh, you got to find it. Heartbreak, I, uh, a fan sent me a full set of the Darkwing action figures. Mm -hmm. So he, he kept Darkwing. <laughs> and it's like, okay. Well, it's like, okay, I'm not a collector. And not only were they still in their original packaging, they hadn't been punched. And that's when I learned that, oh, that's way more valuable. And I, I didn't want them. I mean, they're cool, but it's like, yeah, I've got some, but I have a very tiny office. It's not much deeper on this side of the screen than it is behind me, uh, nor much wider. Um, so I'm just out of space. I'm not going to hang trophies of the, the merchandising of my show because uh, they don't look as good as the actual show. I mean, these are the guys I have that were done for mm -hmm. the crew by one of the crew members as reference. And they look better than any of the merchandising. Um, so anyway, this was given to me while I was doing my convention stuff. I mean, it was sent to me. And generally, some of the major conventions, when you go, they, they want an item to auction off for charity. So this was probably Dragon Con, I think. Uh, so I said, hey, would you be interested in that? And they said, yeah. So I did little card drawings of whatever the villain or hero. And it was like with the toy for their auction. Now, those things are worth a pretty penny. Uh, the problem with those charity auctions is they generally happen early in the morning, often on Sunday. When people are sleeping off their hangovers, there's no advertising for this stuff. Yeah. Now, Dragon Con is, is a place that's not in one convention center. It's like split over seven hotels in a business center. Uh, great con. Um, so I don't know where you would blunder into it to say, oh, I got to make sure I get back for that. Uh, anyway, a guy basically bought them all for... $25 or something I was told because I was curious like what they went for but they were again unpunched all that it was just like oh somebody made a killing it's like oh, well you got some money for charity but you got a big deal on that one uh so we're going to I'm going to try to get through as many possible as possible I'll do shorter answers yeah oh, no you're perfectly fine it's just I just looked up and saw uh mom's cooking dinner so she wanted us all over um so we're going to get to as many as we possibly can um favorite and least favorite episodes by morgan bennett for doxies margo bennett for doxies uh, among my favorites i always talk about that sinking feeling even though it was the first one because it captured how i wanted the characters treated and it got great animation from australia i really like uh, comic book capers mm -hmm or comic book classics, I think is actually the name, just because of the breaking the fourth wall. The idea is that um, there's a Darkwing comic book published, a Darkwing hates because he's treated all wrong in it. So he's gonna write the script. And then we just made a conceit without explaining it. Whoever's writing the script, you start seeing that adventure. And then when Goslin purposely throws a bunch of soap in the dishwasher so the house is full of bubbles Darkwing runs out and then she starts taking it over and the adventure you know slants that way and then Launchpad gets it and he's one fingering it and and then the Binky Muddlefoot from next door comes in very with a prissy idea and there were things like they put a coffee cup down on the comic book art and then in the adventure they run slam into a giant coffee mug that's in the middle of a desert um the pages blow out the window and get found by Megavolt, the electrical villain, and he starts writing it. So suddenly the villain's winning. I just loved that breaking the fourth wall. I thought it was something really original that we did. Um, there are other episodes I like. It's hard. 
I think I, before we started recording, I said, it's hard for me to watch the old stuff because I see what's, as even my favorite episodes, I see what's quote wrong, yeah. or I would edit tighter if I could today. I, you know, I've often said I could cut five minutes out of every episode, more out of some. Um, and it's just, you know, I see that. And then there's just some, because we had a ridiculous schedule. Um, again, I found a, a memo that had our schedule and I sent it to the DuckTales guys. And uh, he said, I'm gonna pin this on the wall <laughs> for the guys when they start complaining because we had to produce one script a week and then the next week, two scripts. And then the next week, one script. Next. We had to alternate that. Uh, not always, not all way through the whole thing but it's just like if the show wasn't quite working it's friday it's gotta go to the next step you know um so i remember uh, you know this studios may have clashes but the same artists and writers like drift around different studios and when i was talking to one of the guys actually it was kevin hops i think who went and did work on um Tiny Toons or Animaniacs, one of the two. Um, and you know, he was talking about, or he was chatting with someone and it got back to me that, oh yeah, we throw out about three scripts a season or however I'm misremembering. But the point is they had enough scripts done that they were allowed to like say, this isn't working, let's throw it out. It's like, what? You got to throw things out? We put those things on the air. Um, so yeah, if I went through, there's some that, and some that I'm sure people would really enjoy, but just wasn't to my taste. I love the Splatter Phoenix episode where she was, where they run through the paintings. Again, we're playing with the format and the medium. Um, and I, there are some characters that I want Quacker Jack to be handled with a slightly different way, a little more serious. And that's not how the voice actor and the writers involved took him. Mm -hmm. But he was working. I wasn't going to overrule them because it's like, no, that's a, that's a fine creative choice. It's not the choice I would have made, but it's working. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get in the way because Friday coming. <laughs> um, and then uh, so I kind of played around with that with the paddy whack. Mm -hmm. the supernatural evil clown and even he was a little sillier I, you know that's one that i think i would have liked to massage around and really you know play with um but anyway characters like the liquidator um <laughs> he is not based on hydro man who i didn't even know exists because that was the era of marvel where i guess i was in college um i didn't know he existed i based him on the sandman because in the early in Spider-Man number four, I'm mean, amazing Spider-Man number four, he was, uh, he actually turned into sand, went down a drain. And I believe at one point, Spider-Man mixes cement in with him and hoses him down. And, and that's how he captures him. And it's basically what we did with Liquidator. So he only had one standalone episode. He had, it was very funny because he always spoke in like salesman talk, um, but he wasn't a, deep character he was two gimmicks he was the powers and the salesman angle whereas Bushroot you know he he just wanted to create a wife for himself he couldn't help it that she turned into be a vampire potato you know I just felt for him Megavolt was somehow had more emotional issues that would get more stories out of uh but some of my story editors loved Liquidator and no, no problem working with him and when we created our supervillain team Liquidator is part of that. And he's a lot of people's one of the favorite, favorite villains, but I don't dislike him. I appreciate the way he is. Uh, but that's a case where I didn't, I didn't try to push characters in a certain way, unless I was doing some of the writing myself, or I didn't stop people from doing too much, you know, unless I felt like they were outside the, the feeling of the show. There was Next. a... <laughs> there was one thing I wanted to, to bring up and it was on the first episode and I talked about it with Jim when Jim was on. Do you guys know you threw uh toss this guy's salad was the, the line. Did you guys know you threw a little analingus joke in there? I'm pretty sure it wasn't even thought about, but Darkwing Duck was talking about eating ass. That was something that came up when I talked. <laughs> it was uh, it was at the end of the first episode. Not intentional, yeah. 
What's that? He was not intentional. He used to have a second phrase with suck gas, evildoer, but people kept hearing it wrong. Yeah. Like and so we, just, he stopped and said that. But uh, I brought I brought that up with Jim and he uh, he blushed like a schoolgirl when I when I told him that one. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's funny. Speaking of Jim, um, I told him about the Russian thing. He says, oh, well, we had to go go there together. We I mean, usually ought to go back together. And I don't know that I said it to him at the time, but of course, Jim wasn't Darkwing in Russia. One, Darkwing was called Black Cloak, and he was played by, I guess, two different guys uh, who were Russians, who spoke Russian. Yeah. Um, and all around the world, other people play Darkwing, not Jim Cummings. But Jim, you know, created the, it wasn't just putting a voice to the character, he did improvise, and then Jeannie McSwain, who he calls Darkwing's mom, um, she would feed him back stuff. Like early on, Darkwing got hit, and Jim did this kind of a squashed voice feeling. And I remember either the next episode or two episodes later, she he was doing a reaction. She said, no, no, do that, do that squash thing. And he did it. So she would constantly feed stuff back to him once we had Jim's performance and he and Ginny working together, those things, of course, are played to all the writers because it's one thing to start writing a character and then you start hearing them. It's like, oh, okay, now he's becoming more and more real and they're, they're writing to the performers. So it doesn't matter who plays Darkwing in Russia or Germany or Scandinavia, that Darkwing was heavily influenced by Jim. Yeah. you know because jim was part of that creation of darkwing duck and i always wanted jim i can't somebody asked me who else was up and i said i we probably tested other people because i wasn't allowed to just pick one guy you know again people had to sign off on things but um i started working with jim on gummy bears he was just such a great guy to, to work with and you know try to feed him back into things and he was great as as dark in rescue rangers we used to record with you know four people it was like cory burton who does a million voices jim does a million voices tress mcneil does a million voices and then like one guest star would come in to give a little variety but it would just you know i really enjoyed working with him and and his dark wing was obviously great he was one of the funniest guests i've ever had on this show i mean it, just how quick he is just to come off oh, yeah. with a joke and it's just like his I would love to see like just how his mind worked when he approached something just to see him in his element where all he's thinking about is this character and all this shit just going on at once and he's got all these things just firing around it's just he, just voice actors alone they're just so they're such an interesting people because like I said they they're used to playing like all of these different characters used to improv and used to coming up with something and just how they can how they not go crazy and some of them do go crazy but how they just don't go crazy or they they appear sane is just baffling because it's like i said they've just got so much shit going in different directions because they're trying to oh, hit yeah. all of these notes it's just wild man it's just like i said he was such a phenomenal person to talk to um yeah. everybody wants to know how his mind works your voice yeah. actor's mind works but in my experience once you start cutting into the skull they get a lot quieter and you don't <laughs> you think Man, this got dark like a DC Comics in the 80s, didn't it, Ted? <laughs> so Frank that, Miller behind me. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a callback. Uh, Xavier, oh, man, I always mess up this guy's name, so I apologize because he always writes in. Xavier Dier, X-A-B-I-D-E-I-R-A. -I, -E -I, I apologize for messing up your name. Were you expecting such a- call him Professor X. So he's used to it. Professor X, <laughs> I like them. Uh, were you ever, ex or were you expecting such an epic theme song? And do you feel that theme songs should make a comeback for cartoons? Um, I love the things theme song when we we heard it, and and again, it was the standout of of what we had. Um, Rescue Rangers um, had a lot of submissions. We had a tape. I. I may have it somewhere i'll have to digitize it if i can ever find it but there was one theme that i liked on rescue rangers um that i was really pushed for but it was a very uh dun, 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 dun. and it was just it was the idea in my mind of grandiose big sounding adventure tune with these little goofy 
rodents, you know, running at it. Jeffrey, quite rightly, wanted a hook as good as as Ducktales Yoohoo, and came up with, you know, we ended up with Chitcha Chip and Dale. I liked that other one so much that in the soundtrack you hear that that's the Rangers theme, not the theme song. But when they go into adventure, you're here. We bought the rights to that music, uh, which was one of the pitches of a, of a song. But with Darkwing, they had fewer people pitching, but that one was a standout. And I don't, and I, although I had a similar take, it wasn't as long and I didn't listen to it as much as, as the other one. But so I love that theme song, you know, a lot. I mean, it was just great. What was the second part? The question? Uh, he said, uh, shit, where am I? Oh, uh, do you feel that theme song? Oh, shit, man, I'm just all over. Oh, the you know, okay, I remember it. You know, should it come back? Um, DuckTales did a great um, update of the DuckTales theme. And uh, I, I thought they split the difference perfectly. Um, with Darkwing, and again, I'm pretty open with, oh, what do you want to do with these characters? Uh, you know, and see what people are doing. Um, I, yeah, offhand, and they, I assume they will use the theme song. Yeah. On the other hand, one of the biggest Darkwing Duck fans I know is this guy called Lin-Manuel Miranda. Mm -hmm. He was introduced to me as if I was the star. And he was just, he used to run home after school and there was no way he could literally run to where his house was, but he could run to his friend's house and every day would go and run to his friend's house to watch, you know, the Disney afternoon. Um, so to have him, I would, I, again, the important thing is to have something that's really catchy, really captures the vibe of the show. Since it is a reboot, you want to do that. But I would just, you know, again, the guy's pretty busy, but it, that would be a case of, I know how much you love this character and you love the theme song. In fact, he talks about the theme song. Um, when you're in trouble, you call DW. Mm -hmm. as he called that a triple rhyme or, or something he had an expression for it he says that's a direct line from that phrase to a certain song in in the heights that has the same kind of internal rhyme and that stuck in his mind so we have that much of a love of the character and as a fan i'm sure he would like the original thing but on the other hand it's like yeah but how would you arrange it or would there be a rap in the middle and how funny would the rap be? yeah i have no idea i would be open but it's like anything else. It's like, is would the show be better with the exact same theme song or better with something different? Who knows? When you hear the thing, I don't want to hear just somebody, oh, we're just going to use the old version and, yeah. and just play it and just remix it. Like, well, thanks for not trying. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like, it's like, it's like I told people about DuckTales. I said, no, we did the DuckTales for the last century. Mm -hmm. These guys are doing the DuckTales for this century. Yeah. It was a long time ago. Why would you do so? You know, people watch different kinds of shows. There's a different kind of a culture around us. There's different vibes. Why wouldn't that be part of your entertainment? Yeah. I'm, I'm interested to see what they do. Uh, I got to imagine there's going to be some pretty heavily influenced. You might even hear some of the uh, some of the callbacks into it. Um, <clears throat> Casimir the Great wants to know, any plans for the scrap third animated Hellboy? No. Nope. The, uh, we got to write it. <laughs> I think I have the file somewhere. Um, that was, again, that was a company um, that while we were in production, it was sold to another company, to SARS. Actually, Stars now owns all that stuff. So now this, they didn't even know they had purchased an animation company <laughs> because it was part of this huge deal that they were buying for content. Just they had hours and hours of, of movies and stuff. Uh, what saved it, I think more than anything else, is that was the company doing The Simpsons, mm -hmm. literally not writing it, but they were the production house doing The Simpsons. And it was like, we have something to do with, okay, we'll keep The Simpsons going, you know, kind of thing. Um, but Mike and I wrote the third, uh, I think it would have been the best one. The first one was like about Hellboy short stories, uh, 
and I think the connective tissue could have been better, but um, that's how a lot of early Hellboy, not, it wasn't just the big original arc, there were these little stories and a lot of the feeling came out of those two of, of the character. Uh, so the second one was about different short stories. And, and in fact, we literally took one heads from a comic about these Japanese floating head vampires uh, and animated it. Then the second one was about Hellboy's roots in Central Europe, which is witches and werewolves and, and all of that. Uh, and then the third one is going to be the side of Hellboy. That's the mad scientist, pulp, lobster Johnson, cybernetic apes, uh, heads in jars floating around, uh, Nazis, or whether we had to rename them or not, whatever, that kind of vibe. Um, and we read it and it was like the first two overlapped. So there was no learning curve. We were just, I mean, ever since I left Disney, every project I did got a smaller budget and a tighter schedule. Yeah. Um, anyway, the, uh, the first two overlaps, there was no learning curve. And then it was like, there was a gap when those two had gone out and, um, we could actually we knew what worked really well and what didn't work as well and then would go that way um because i was literally a hellboy comics fan you know people used to think you know you show up at a convention the the producer always oh i'm a huge fan you know of various properties and you realize well yeah once you're signed on the project you bought all the comics and read them and became a fan hopefully but no i used to be on the hellboy bulletin boards at hellboy.com before i was <laughs> doing that at all i actually pitched hellboy when i was still at disney um and uh anyway the company in the middle of that got sold and they had no interest they weren't going to do original productions at that time so that went and now it's been the right I assume are with Universal, who did the last Hellboy movie. Uh, I just saw something online about Ron Perlman talking about he'd love to do the third one. Yeah, he wants like, to do it. Yeah, he wants yeah, to but, do it. But that whoever had the rights back then no longer have the rights. It's now at Universal, and then it's kind of like, you know, it's people ask me, "Hey, why don't you do this?" or "Why don't you such?" And it's like I. I, Disney owns all those characters, you know. <laughs> they paid me a very nice salary to do all that stuff. They own it all. I, I have no say in the stuff, you know. Yeah. Uh -huh. So yeah, so there are no plans for that. And in fact, Mike just said, okay, just never put it online. So it's like I'm not going to be publishing the third script at any point. And I, I, I hope that one gets to see the light of day because I've, 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 uh, I've really been a fan of that one. I, I bought all of those in trades, um, and. I, it's crazy that he is still as prolific as he is with that character. I mean, oh, yeah. So it, it, it's, it's, like I said, pick it up if you got it. Maybe we can drum up some interest for it. Um, I'm going to send you this one because this guy went pretty in depth uh, with his question. And I want to make sure that, that, that we answer it. So if you don't mind, you're Salty Dorito. He had my favorite name for anybody that submitted any questions. He had a really, really in-depth question. So would you mind if I just send you that question and then I, I can I can be the conduit? Sure, where will it, where will it pop up on the DMs uh, well, that we were using before? Yeah, I can I can send it through you that one. Or I know it was done on Twitter. I don't know if he tagged you in it. Uh, it was the last couple of days, but um, I can find it and then I'll bump it or I can send it to you through message. I can do it. On, I'll okay. find Twitter. Hold on for a second. Yeah. Yeah, yeah go a, ahead and DM me on, on Twitter. Okay, yeah, so we'll, we'll make sure we get that one answered offline because I'm, I'm pretty sure that one's got some some uh, some trap doors in it. But it was a really good question. It was really thoughtful. So we got a couple here and then we'll get out of here. Um, where are we at? Uh, right there. Oh, um, will there be a new animated series with, and this is coming from Melissa Rivera. Uh, will there be a new animated series with Gosselin as the new hero? Any news on something like that or stay tuned I, think, that's I would think no only in that the production company working on it right now is is working on it so it it's it's not like it has disney has all those rights disney i suppose could say oh while you're working on that we're gonna do this show or whatever um but 
I mean, at this point, I haven't seen anything, you know, I would hope Goslin is in the show. But like I say, I think that's part of what Darkwing is. Um, but yeah, I don't, I'm pretty sure there wouldn't be any development going on. But again, I'm retired, so it's not like, and nobody's at the studio. This is the weirdest time. I look at these movies that are coming out, Raya and the Magic, The Last Dragon and and the, the Pixar stuff, the, um, all that stuff is being done in people's bedrooms, yeah, you know, yeah. just, and the fact that they're not getting together to just brain, they do brainstorm, but they have to do it on screen. It's just amazing that they're doing that. So uh, anyway, it's not like people can meet in the hallway and say, you know, what if we did this kind of thing? It's like, no, it would have to be a little more official, like the end of the Zoom meeting or something. Um, but my guess is no, nothing's happening with that. And really, if you're going into something, a reboot, your job is to make that reboot so successful that everybody wants to see more episodes of that, you know, not, oh, what else can come out of this? It's just like, just keep us enthralled. It's not like Star Wars, you do something and then you can and spin off all the other shows or even the Marvel Universe and you have TV shows spinning off. This would be no, this is where the character exists. We are telling her story. Her story is her with Darkwing. We're not going to leap up again in an episode. They certainly could leap her into the future. Darkwing goes in the future. I mean, we did the episode Dark Warrior Duck where the Frank Miller version of Darkwing exists and Goslin sees what happens if she wasn't part of his life. Uh, yeah, you could do an episode you know, it would be worth kicking around to do the reverse of that. Darkwing gets thrown in the future and he sees what happens to Goslin. Yeah. You know, she becomes the Dark Warrior Duck. That's an awesome episode. I would okay that in a, in a, oh, a second. Yeah. You're probably writers of that, one. you know. Why that does like a really good one. Uh, All right. But right now, no, no plans that I know of. Beautiful. Larry wants to know, and Larry's our, our like I said, our tech editor. Very rarely does he write in for any kind of questions, but uh, so whenever he does, I got to make sure I ask him. Uh, who do you call when there's trouble? Ghostbusters. Exactly. Most, I, was, trouble. I was hoping you were going to say that because I said that, and then he sent me a dot, 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 no, Darkwing Duck dummy. And I was like, I know, but it was right there. It was low hanging fruit. So I'm glad you did that. And I'm going to use this as the clip. Because yeah, I'm, I'm into the paranormal stuff. You know, <laughs> you know it was funny when I retired from Disney. I had my quote library is not that big, but reference books and all that. I would have certain reference books if I was doing Atlantis or um or even a Darkwing or something like that. And then if I'm doing a science fiction show, I got certain books I went around me. And then if I'm doing more of a paranormal development, then those books go home and others come. Um and then when I left Disney, I realized, oh, my office was an annex. <laughs> Now all that crap has to be in the same spot, you know, but yeah, I have my supernatural shelf down there, my Hellboy wall there and, you know, comedy writing down here and just general books. And even then I did a little Marie condoing and saying like, I can get rid of some of this stuff. All right. And this is the last one. This is another guy that's got a very thoughtful uh, one. And this is whenever we can do this, I like doing uh, talking about somebody that's no longer with us. Uh, so Cameron wrote in, he said, along with Dexter, uh, from Dexter's Lab and Chucky, Chucky Fenster from Rugrats. Goslin may be Christine's most memorable voice role, Christine Kavanaugh. Do you remember what it was like meeting Christine for the first time? What uh, was she your first choice for Goslin? And what are your most special memories of her as a person? Uh, so I don't want to ask you all those questions. And one thing, like I said, I like highlighting when somebody's not here. We did this when um, we did the Rugrats episode with Paul Germain, the co-creator mm -hmm. of uh, Rugrats a couple, uh, a couple weeks ago. But do you have a, a memory, uh, maybe uh, an interaction or anything you might have had with uh, Miss Kavanaugh uh, when she was voicing God? Um, I don't remember meeting her the first time. She's just one of the sweetest people in the world. and was very cute and very much Goslin. Well, I won't say that Goslin was personality wise is very tough. And, and you know, I don't think of Chris that way. Um, but Chrissy was she would do line readings like you would never think of <laughs> it's like to the extent of i had to, especially one of my story editors and he did this with everybody there is that thing where i'm hiring actors to act when you're writing you're acting in your mind 
some of you may be great mind actors, but sometimes you're just doing like, oh, here's the normal way to do the line. You have to resist that, trying to get the actor to do it your way, because then it's like you're dumbing down the acting. Well, with Goslin, it's just like how she would do something. There are times when I would, I would think, ah, is the gag coming across because she played that in so weird a way, but we still go with it because it was like, that was so much that character. Mm -hmm. um, just super sweet and very, you know, and that was one of her early gigs, as I recall. And then she went on to do a lot more stuff, yeah. Yeah, she's definitely one of those voices from her childhood. When we think of Mount Rushmore's, in my opinion, I mean, she's she's up there for me. Uh, she, like I said, from Babe to Dexter to Chucky Finster to Goslin. I mean, we can keep going. Uh, Ablina from Our Real Monsters. I mean, it, she, it's sad that she's no longer here, but I'm glad that, you know, time will forget some things, but time will never forget just how like we started, started at the beginning of the show or halfway through the show when we were talking about the, the people that have reached out and told you how this show might have gotten them through a tough time. You know, we, we look at voices or we hear voices. It's the same thing with food. You smell something and it instantly transports you back to when you were a little kid. Oh, fuck, I remember the first time I ever had spaghetti and meatballs. Or, oh, shit, that's Dexter. And she also played Chucky. She also played Oblina. She also played Gosling. She also, so it transports you. It, it, it's just- You know, people- if people go to my Facebook page and don't friend me because I'm at the limit or pretty close to it now. Um, you can follow me, but just if you go to it and just scroll down two years, maybe somewhere, um, or maybe search for online, maybe somebody duplicated it. I don't know what I would call it. Anyway, I was, we digitized a bunch of, of family movies and in the center was a videotape I did of the rehearsal for just us, just the Stucks. So you'll see Christine and Jim and all the guys who played, all the villains and the heroes, uh, all in the same room. Cause we used, and they don't do this anymore. Um, now people tend to get recorded, you know, apart. Uh, we would try to record them like a radio show with everybody in the room and they worked their schedule so that the cast was in the room so they could play off each other. And I actually went in and, and videotaped it. And it's very grainy, very crappy looking, but uh, you'll see Christine acting. You'll see the interaction, how they kid with each other and all of that. Uh, but that's a little cool bit of history. I wish I had a better copy of. Anyways, try searching for that. And you'll see Christine and everybody else in action. Um, I got a question. Would you mind if we use that in the video? Uh, I would love to. Yeah, you find it. I'm not yeah, I'll, sure see, I I'll see if I can find it and I'll see if my uh, my tech guy can do some magic stuff. I'd love to end that end this episode with that where the fans can kind of see that. I think that'd be a really cool sure. um, just moment in history. And I also like to ask permission before I do. Um, but Tad, and, and I've, not, it, I've not seen your deep question that you did you send it to me on Twitter? Or is it? Oh, no, I, I thought we tagged it, but uh, give me one second. Let me wrap this up real quick, and I'll make sure I, I, I tag you into it. Because like I said, it was pretty in-depth, and you actually just referenced it, Justice Duck, so I'm pretty sure Salty salty Dorito is going to be very, very happy that, that you mentioned it. But uh, he's been Tad. I've been Julian. Don't follow him on Facebook because he's at the limit. Uh, just, <laughs> follow, <laughs> just follow him, man. This has been another piece of your childhood. Good night. <laughs>